Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. And notice uh, verse, well, chapter 11, verse 7 says this. Life is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. And the church said, Amen. Chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now, he says this because he says, if you're fortunate, you're going to live to be old. And then he's going to, he's going to tell us some of the, the uh, symptoms of being old. He says, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. In other words, you get tired. I remember one time um, uh, a, a man that I know uh, celebrated his, um, I think it was his 75th birthday And uh, no, that's not actually right. He had gone to the doctor to get a a physical and the the doctor declared him to be in good shape for his age and all that. And I said, so you're good for another 75 years, huh? He said, Dennis, I don't want another 75 years. He said, I'm not interested in another 75 years here on this earth. So he he says uh, that may happen to some people. They live that long uh, to where they find no pleasure. In the verse 2, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the grinders, that's teeth, when the grinders cease because they are few. And those looking through the windows, that's eyes, grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When men rise up at the sound of birds, you wake up too early. Uh, but, but all their songs grow faint. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along. And desire is no longer stirred. This man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And so he's talking about life. He says life uh, is sweet uh, in, in chapter 11, and it is to be enjoyed. And yet he says, um, there will come a time when maybe you had all about, about all the life that you want, you know, uh, because uh, of some of the infirmities of, uh, of uh, age and so forth. This is Job I'm reading to you now. And by the way, while you're turning to Job chapter 14, um, this would not apply, of course, to those of you who are young. And I'll let, I'll let you decide what young means, okay? But let me ask you this. Have you already lived longer than you thought you would? Anybody, I don't raise your hand, but just think about that a little bit. Uh, I, I can actually remember when I when I was a, a teenager that I thought if I make it to thirty, I'm fine, you know, because after that, there's you know, there's not much to live for anymore after that. So just get, I want to get to thirty, and then it's okay if I. Well, I, of course, I quickly changed my mind once I got, you know, along about twenty nine, and and now I find with grandchildren that I want to live as long as I possibly can. You know, that's that seems to be my attitude now. But this is Job fourteen. By the way, do you know? Um, Have you ever heard someone say that they're old, you know, and they say, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. (laughs) You know, some people have that attitude that, man, you know, uh, I'd be in better shape if I didn't practice a little bit better maintenance along the way. But we can also think of uh, people that we know and people that our loved ones and family and friends and all that whose uh, lives were, uh, were cut way too short. And we prayed for a family this morning. Thanks to Joanne's request who, you know, with, the, with the young woman whose life was cut too short. Well, this is, um, this is Job, Job 14.1. He says, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. In other words, life is short and is full of trouble. Now let's go to James and read that famous statement that James makes in James chapter 4. He says, uh, verse 13, he says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What 
is your life? You are a mist or a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this, that, and the other. Okay, uh, so that sets up what we're talking about tonight. Adam, let's go to the next slide. And here's a good question. Are our days numbered? Now, the, let me tell you now that the answer to that is yes, no, sometimes, and maybe. Okay, and now I've got you really confused, right? Because I, there is, a, there is a, a way in which each one of those, uh, those res, re, responses to the question uh, answer. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. When God is so disgusted with humanity, he said, I'm going to number their days and their days are going to be 120 years. He said, and that's it. And so there was a time in history when God says, you know, that we're going to go, we, you're going to live this long and no longer. Why? Because he was going to send the great flood. Um, and then there is uh, Psalm chapter 90. Let's go to that. Uh, Psalm 90. And he says that life, uh, you can expect to live a, a certain amount of years, you know, if certain things transpire or don't transpire. This is verse 10. He says, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. And so he says, uh, you know, you can, you can expect to... 70 years, maybe 80. Uh, you, can, you can have good confidence that you'll last that long. Now, we all know people who've lived past age 100. Matter of fact, uh, I keep seeing these statistics about the growing number of people who are past 100 in the United States. And yet there are some countries where the, the average age span is like 35 or 6 years old. Uh, in Japan, which they seem to have the longest lifespan, their average lifespan, I think, is up in the eight, past 80. Uh, but with, when you look at the, um, the uh, lifespans of people, when you put it all together in the world today, females, now this is when you put all countries together, females can expect to live, on average, 68 years and four months. Males, 64 years and four months. And if you combine the two, the average for both male and female is 66 years uh, and three months. And so that's the average worldwide. Which means that if we took better care of ourselves, see, we're not even reaching the, uh, the biblical average age yet. Uh, because, I mean, it says 70, perhaps 80. And yet uh, worldwide right now, we're, you know, people are living to be 66 years and three months uh, on average. And so uh, uh, we've got some, uh, we've got some um, improving to do in the way we live our lives. Okay, here's an article and a pretty good one. Not, not a biblical article, but I'm going to add some scripture to it. It says, seven secrets to living to be 100 in good health. Notice the seven secrets to living to be 100 in good health. And this is written by... Uh, a particular doctor, uh, Dr. Stephen Jones, board-certified geriatric medicine specialist, and he believes that um, we ought to we we ought to we ought to uh, live in such a way and take care of ourselves in such a way and that we live to be 120. Now that's his opinion. He doesn't have any Bible on that, but that's his opinion. And so um, he talks about uh, in in 1900, uh, the average American lifespan was uh, 47. And so it's grown uh, tremendously since then. People are living longer and longer. But he says, um, let me offer you seven ways uh, to, uh, to stretch life, to increase the length of our days. Number one, he says, take control of stress. Because stress wears you down. You know, it wears you out. It creates all kinds of other kinds of physical ailments. And so stress needs to be controlled. He says when you're under stress, your body releases cortisol, known as the stress hormone. Uh, cortisol accelerates uh, the body's uh, aging processes, speeding up aging. Um, he says focus on relaxation in daily life. Uh, and he said the events themselves are not stressful. It's our response to them. Uh, that make us tense. For example, if we're stuck in traffic, and I, that happens to me every once in a while, don't spend the time whipping yourself into a road rage. Instead, listen to the radio, meditate, or pray. 
You'll get there in the same amount of time, but you won't be stressed out. Number two, he says, get plenty of sleep. And he says that, um, that it's a myth that uh, older people need less sleep. Older people might get less sleep, but they need, uh, all adults need seven or eight hours, uh, no matter their age. However, as you age, deep restorative sleep becomes more elusive. A few hours before bedtime, avoid caffeine, uh, relax quietly, avoid activities that are stressful or require high alertness. And he says, invest in a good mattress because you spend hopefully a third of your life uh, on, a, on a mattress, so get a good one. Well, the scripture says in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus said to, his, to the apostles, actually, he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and let's get some rest. That's what the Lord said. Now, this is God, but he's in flesh, and his body uh, would become weary, and so um, he said, let's get some rest. And then number three, to stretch our years, laugh a lot. A good belly laugh reduces blood pressure, the article says. It clears the lungs and produces endorphins, the so-called happy hormone that reduces pain. The average child laughs 300 times a day. Adults, 17 times a day. Why? Because we're all serious, you know. We get to be grown up. And so children, they laugh, these joyful laughs, and they, they just have fun. Adults, you know, we get all serious, and we're, we forget. To, well, the scripture says this in Proverbs 20, 17, 22, uh, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And so we need to keep our... He says, look for humor in life. And if you look for humor in life, you can find it. Exercise, number four, exercise daily. He says, our bodies crave movement. He says, the worst thing we can do for our health is sit around and do nothing. Even if we're 80, he says, you can still build muscle mass if you will uh, uh, do certain exercises. And so he says, it's never too late to start uh, exercising. He says, the key is finding some sort of exercise and that you enjoy and make it part of your daily routine. Well, the scripture says that exercise is good for you. 1 Timothy 4, 8. Now, he says godliness is better for you. But he doesn't say, he says uh, physical exercise has value. Has value. Uh, it profits us, the scripture says. But he says spiritual exercise profits us even more. And so if you, you don't have to choose between the two. We can do both. We can exercise physically and we can exercise spiritually. And then he says um, uh, find a, a companion or be, be involved in having close friends or pets. Make it a goal to meet people. Uh, volunteer at, at church groups or community groups. And he says um, don't be afraid to be alone, but beware of social isolation. In other words, have other people in your life. This is Romans 14, 7. None of us lives to himself and, 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 and or lives alone, and none of us dies to ourselves alone. In other words, we are created uh, to be involved with other people and to add value to their life and to be blessed uh, by the value that they can add to our lives. And then number six, use your brain. He says that people, uh, doctors even used to say, uh, that once uh, the brain has deteriorated a certain amount, there's nothing you can do to regenerate it and to revive it. But he says that's not true. He says that um, uh, important connections between brain cells can be reestablished. And when your brain is stimulated, uh, more connections are made no matter your age. So he says stimulate your brain by learning new things. Such as uh, take a different route home. Explore a different neighborhood. Uh, try eating with your left hand if you're right-handed. And eat with your right hand if you're left-handed. And so make yourself embrace new things. And then, of course, think, think, think. Now, the best thinking I, I am convinced of, and, and I haven't read this and I haven't heard anyone say it. I just uh, think that, uh, you know, I've learned this from experience. The best thinking we can do is prayer. I mean, if you really want to pray... Um, it requires some thinking. You, you got to, you know, you got to engage your mind. I mean, you're talking, we're talking when we're praying to the creator of the universe. And we need to put some thought into it. And think about, I mean, you just don't want to just, uh, just, just carelessly and recklessly talk to the God of the universe. And so put some thinking into it. 
And then the scripture says in 2 Timothy 2, 15, Do your best to study or present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of God. And so keep the brain active. And then number seven, live in the moment. Um, Why? Because as we've learned already from James chapter 4, life is a mist, a vapor that appears for a little time. And so he says, don't don't spend time uh, mourning over the past and don't worry about the future. Live in the moment, relish every moment and treat every day as a gift because that's why they call today the present. It's a present or a gift. Okay, so um, that's some of the things we learned from the, the article. Now, this is Proverbs three thirteen through 18. Um, turn with me to that, please. And we, we looked at this last week briefly when we were looking at 1 Corinthians chapter, I mean, two weeks ago, uh, chapters 1 and 2. This is uh, the blessing of, of wisdom, Proverbs 3, beginning in verse 13. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is at her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all of her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. And so the scripture says here that we are to be the kind of people who seek wisdom. Now let's go to the New Testament. This time we're in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. And what we're about to see is we're about to see one of the Ten Commandments quoted from Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. But he says beginning in verse 1, Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on this earth. I heard a TV preacher say not long ago, um, honor the womb that bore you or gave you life. But the scripture says not only honor your mother, but honor your father as well, that it may go well with us and that we may live a long life. And so, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I should have advanced the slide. The question is being asked, can we lengthen or shorten our lives? Now, Hezekiah, uh, in, in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 20, um, he, uh, he saw that his life was about over. And he prayed. And, you know, God does things for his own reasons in his own time. And we can't explain why sometimes we pray for someone and yet God doesn't extend their lives. But in this case, Hezekiah prayed and, and his life was extended 15 years. 15 years. Now, you're not going to hear me say that Hezekiah is the only person that God is going to extend life for. I think we need to pray and to trust and believe and, and just let the Lord handle it. But I think all of us you know, need to be praying. If we want to live, that we need to be praying and if we want our loved ones to live, and that our life will be uh, spared and extended. Proverbs ten twenty seven: The fear of the Lord, which means respect for God, adds length to life. The fear of the Lord adds length to life. Now, it's important for us, uh, uh, next slide, to realize that no matter what we do and no matter how well we take care of ourselves... And, uh, and no matter what, uh, what is going, what, how we are managing our lives, there are certain things that are beyond our control. And God is in control. He's in control of everything. This is a Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Beginning in verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. I was woven together in the depths of the ocean. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. And so what he's saying there is God is in control and that God knows how long we're going to live. 
Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking, so does this mean that God knows that I'm going to have an accident sometime in the future? Or that I'm going to uh, be uh, diagnosed with some kind of deadly disease? And, uh, and the answer is, God is in the now. He's not in the tomorrow and he's not in the yesterday. He's all, he is the God of the present. That's why when Moses approached that burning bush and that voice came out of it and told him to go tell Pharaoh to let God's people go, uh, Moses said, well, who, who am I going to tell Pharaoh sent me? And he says, you, you tell him that I am that I am. Not I used to be or I will be, but I am. I'm in the now. I'm in the present. I'm in the right now. And so, as a result of that, uh, we realize that, that uh, God is in the now and he's in control. And he knows whatever he chooses to know. Now, he may not choose to know the day that your heart stops beating. Uh, but if he chose to know, he knows. Because he knows everything. There's nothing that he cannot do and there's nothing that he cannot know. Now... Uh, here's an interesting thing in First Chronicles chapter 10. Let me read you a little bit of this. This is about Saul. And Saul by this time has gotten on the wrong side of the Lord's will. And as a result of this, he's in trouble. And the Lord is allowing the Philistines and the Philistine army to um, overcome Saul and, and the army of the Israelites. And so verse 1, 1 Chronicles 10. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them. And many were slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons. And they killed his sons. Sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malachua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him. Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that, saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died. So Saul and all of his three sons, all three sons, and all of his house died together. Okay, now that's what happened. But listen to this just a few verses later. Verse 13. Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. Listen to this next sentence. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to, his, to uh, uh, David, the son of Jesse. You say, but we just read that Saul took his own life. Well, in this case, uh, the Lord is taking full credit for the death. He's saying the Lord put him because he was not faithful. He, wouldn't, he even went to the magicians or the mediums. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the um, sorcerers, so to speak, of that day and time, instead of seeking the one and true God, the only one who could actually help him. And I, you know, I can't explain it except all I know is the scripture says, so the Lord put him to death. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure I understand exactly all that that means, except that it's just one way in which the scripture is reminding me that God is in control of everything. Now, um, if I don't take care of myself, God is not going to make me take care of myself. You see, he gives you that freedom and that, and that uh, amount of, uh, of control over your own life. And, um, you know, if I decide to harm myself in some way, God is uh, not, not necessarily going to rescue or intervene. But he's in control of all things all the time. And nothing surprises the Lord. You never get, you never catch him, you know, and his jaw drops and he says, well, I didn't see that coming. Now, the Lord is going to know whatever happens, it was going to happen. Next slide. We can lose our lives too soon. Um, and, um, you know, you, you read about uh, some innocent child being uh, uh, shot because of some kind of uh, gang uh, uh, shooting in town. And a, and a stray bullet hits a child. And well, that, that wasn't the Lord's will that that child's life be taken uh, so soon. And so we can lose our lives to disease and accidents and, and the carelessness and the recklessness of, of other people and even uh, the, the evil deeds of other people. And then sometimes our own carelessness. But we don't have to lose our souls. 
We cannot just decide how long we're going to live and say, I'm going to live until 2000 and, you know, mark a date on the calendar and I'm going to feel good. And then when I get to that day, then maybe I'm just going to, you know, just fall, fall out just like that. We, can, we don't have that kind of power. We're not in control that way. But one thing that God has given us control over is the salvation of our souls. Next slide. Uh, because, you see, we are taught in the scripture how to live forever. Not in the physical form in which we're in now, but in the form where uh, we will always be young, and that where we will never grow old and stay old, and where we will uh, live in a, in, a, in a way in which we'll have no pain, no sorrow, and no, we won't need eyeglasses and hearing aids and, and toupees and the name of all this other stuff that we sometimes use to patch ourselves up, pacemakers and... And uh, what else, you know, uh, who knows, all kinds of things, you know, artificial joints and things like that. There will come a day in which uh, we will be forever young because God has provided a savior for us. We can't control how long we live in this life, but we can control because it's a gift that God has given us, uh, the fact that we live forever with God in heaven. And so the scripture says that, the, that he wants to save us, 1 Timothy 2, 4. And that if we hear the gospel of Jesus, Romans ten seventeen, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John eight twenty four, repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess faith in Jesus that we believe he is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And receive baptism for forgiveness of sin, Acts two thirty eight, And then remain faithful until we die. We will live forever. And that eternal life is available to anyone and everyone tonight who ne- who has not yet accepted it, but you know you want it and you want to receive it, and you'll never find a better time than right now. Now, if you're a Christian already, you've obeyed the gospel, but you need the prayers of the church, now would be the perfect time to ask the church to pray with you and for you. So come to the Lord right now while together we stand and sing.